special looks good. Traveling up. Water towers fly! Yikes. You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these. All right, folks, you know the drill. Let me know if you can hear us today. It's time for a special episode of NSF Live. I've got Alicia Seagull with me. I'm John Galloway, and we're going to be doing a partnership show here with Intrepid Museum. Wherever you're watching from, we've got it on all sorts of different channels. But let me know if you can hear us and see us over in chat. Give me some 5 by 5s wherever you're watching. It basically is going everywhere, and, well, we go everywhere, too. How you doing, Alicia? Yeah, I'm doing great. I am doing great. Quite a week this week, huh? <laughs> it's been a little bit of a week. It's been a big a orange week, I guess you could say, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. We're not talking Definitely about Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> It was a fiery week, for sure. It was a very bright and loud week. It was an explosive week, week there you I go. think. A controlled explosion, though. It was a very controlled, explosive week. A controlled, explosive week. Yeah. <laughs> that ended up with a spacecraft on its way around the moon. Yeah, it's super close, too. I think the closest uh, closest approach is tomorrow. It is. Right? It like is. 80 I mean, miles, and then it's going to go whoo, even further and then come back. Following the NASA tracker, I saw they pulled go, no go for the actual lunar insertion or lunar capture, I guess, instead of just whew, flying by and coming back. Um, so that was the thing. Of course, we're talking about the launch of the Artemis 1 mission. You probably saw that here on the channel down at the Cape. A lot to do with that, and I guarantee you we're going to be doing a bit of a recap of that after the mission, I don't know, Spend some more time going around the moon. Um, for today, we have a very special NSF Live. You know that we do these NSF Lives in partnership with Intrepid Museum, Intrepid Museum in partnership with NASA Space Flight. Um, today, we're going to be having some special guests from NASA talk to us. Alicia, you want to tell us a little bit about the special guests? Yeah, so we have people here today from uh, the Space Technology Mission Directorate. So these are some people that have been actually working on technology that will eventually someday help to inform our trips to the moon and beyond to Mars. Um, very exciting missions, very exciting work that they have been doing for quite some time now. So yeah, excited to uh, bring them on and uh, hear about some of the very cool uh, demonstrations that they've been doing lately. Absolutely. We're going to we're gonna jump right into it, actually. This is a little mm -hmm. bit different. Sometimes we do a pre-show, and the original idea was we let people sort of get into the show, and, you know, it's like filling into the theater and finding your seats. But we're not doing that today. We're going to jump straight in with our special <laughs> guests at the very start of the show. Housekeeping okay. first, remember the NASA Space Flight slash Intrepid Museum Virtual Astronomy Lives don't just happen. They're supported through a NASA cooperative agreement awarded to the new two the New York Space Grant Consortium. So massive thanks to the New York Space Grant Consortium for the support in helping us make these shows happen. Without further ado, let's get our special guests from NASA on the line. I mean, they're already on the line. We're just going to show them to... Anyways, you know how it goes. Friends from <laughs> NASA. <laughs> how are you doing? Trudy and Tanya, Hi, it's good to see you. Hello. Hi. Guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Alicia. All right. So with us, everyone, uh, we have Trudy Cordes, the Director of Technology Demonstrations in NASA's Space Technology mm -hmm. Mission Directorate up there. Uh, and then we've also got Tanya Laughinghouse, Program Manager for Technology Demonstrations in Missions in that division. Um, and their teams, like I kind of said before, they're focused on developing technology and really proving their capabilities for missions to the moon and beyond to Mars someday, because in many ways, the moon is actually going to serve as a proving ground for Mars. So welcome to you both. So excited to have you on the show today uh, and to hear a little bit about some of the cool things that you're working on. Um, you you know, NASA is making such incredible technology all the time, but so often a lot of us don't really hear about it until it is actually launching or sending us back, you know, pioneering groundbreaking information. Um, so you all are really some of the brains behind developing this cool technology. So can you tell us just a bit about what your division does and some of the types of projects that you work on in general? Uh, Trudy, we can start with you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, just like a 
good student in school, I always wait to be called on. Um, first of all, before I start, Alicia, I have to ask you, are you wearing capsule parachute and capsule earrings? Okay. I am indeed, I, yes. I, I, uh, I thought this would be appropriate because of the heat shield on the bottoms. <laughs> Not only that, but Orion is doing some amazing things right now. I think they're uh, getting ready to do their, you know, lunar flyby. And I think they get like 80 miles from the surface of the moon. And anyway, so I hope I bet any money our audience today is following that that closely for sure yeah yeah well listen thanks for having us uh, me on the and, and us on the show today um uh we're, i'm really proud of the work we do in technology demonstrations i would say it's kind of a, a lesser known program um that that nasa conducts and um <laughs> really proud to be a part of it. I uh, work with a great team of people. So I'm the uh, director of technology demonstrations that's uh, within the space technology mission directorate that's um, out of NASA headquarters. And uh, we develop and demonstrate uh, transformative cross -cut cutting system level demonstrations. We conduct them in environment in which that uh, technology is, is needs to operate in the future. And um, uh, we try to take the technology to the point where it can be utilized or handed off to whatever, you know, stakeholder or customer uh, or partner organization will will use it. And we have a lot of examples of those we can we can get into here um, during the course of the show, um, including something that we just launched uh, last week the low earth uh, orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator. It's a heat shield, like you stated. Um, and that happened just a few days before the Artemis launch. And it also was a flight test. And so I realized how, what an honor it was for us to be launched within the same week as another major flight test at the agency. Of course, that was the flight test probably more people were paying attention to with <laughs> Artemis one getting off the, the, the ground but a little bit, a little bit more attention to, but I do like to think that, that, you know, our tech, the technology demonstration got, got some amount of, of attention and it did very well. So we can talk about that um, through the, the course of the show. So anyway, again, thank you to be here. Happy to talk about uh, what, whatever folks want to talk about today on a, on a Sunday, a cold Sunday afternoon. I would think it's safe to say for almost the entire country, everyone's below average temperatures right now where they're at. So yeah, that's it. That's it for Great. me. Okay. And Tanya, so you work um, in a, in a subdivision <laughs> of that whole uh, division then, right? That's right. Well, specifically, uh, so Trudy is with uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. Um, and I manage the uh, largest program within space tech, which is technology demonstration. So Trudy is program director actually of tech tech demonstrations, and I am program manager of technology demonstration missions, or TDM for short, because that's a that's a, a, a pretty long name. Um, but but you know our responsibilities here in the program office, and we're actually hosted at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, and so we really work hand in hand with Trudy and her deputy. Um, um, you know, really supporting all of the um, advanced technology projects and missions that are within our portfolio. Um, and what we what we always say is we're looking for them to, you know, have their day in the sun, you know, to advance through their life cycle, um, you know, uh, properly maturing it so that we can we can have their day in the sun like Lofted did on on the early morning of November the 10th. That's great. And, you know, actually, I think we've uh, featured people from your team before now that I think of it, uh, the, the Mars helicopter, right? Ingenuity, we had Teddy Zanettis on here. Um, spectacular episode, actually. He was great. Um, I just saw that flying across the screen in that video that we're showing now. So really, really cool stuff you guys are working on. Um, but yeah, so let's let's just dive right in now. The the big one recently, um, you know, you've had, like you said, kind of an exciting week and a half now. Um, super successful launch of Lofted, the low Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator. Um, really, really fascinating thing here. Um, can you just kind of give an overview for, for people who aren't familiar, in your own words, the people who really worked on it? How would you describe this to everyone? What is Lofted in a nutshell? Tanya, you want to start? You want me to jump in? Because it can kind of fit in a nutshell, right? It gets real small. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, that that is exactly right. So so Lofted is a flight test of an inflatable heat shield. 
um, and, and it's a, a test of HIA technology, which is hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, which is a mouthful. Uh, so we like to say HIA for short. Um, but all prior tests of this HIA technology have typically been suborbital, which mean which means it's launched and goes straight up and it comes straight down. Lofted was actually an orbital uh, test flight, which meant it went uh, full orbit around the Earth and then uh, it came back. And so the energy was much higher. And uh, one of the things we wanted to know was to see how it performed at orbital velocities. Um, and when you said, yes, it's, it's come back, it's made of a flexible woven um, thermal protection system. So it's very pliable. And one of the things about um, uh, previous types of heat shields is that they've been like rigid bodies. And um, a heat shield being launched, you know, previously can really only be as big or as wide as the um, as the fairing of the spacecraft that it's being launched in, right? Uh, the launch vehicle fairing. What's so special about, um, you know, the, the lofted technology is that because it's made of that, flo that flexible woven uh, thermal protection system, it is very pliable. And so it can be um, folded very tightly. And because of that, you can have um, more room, more space for other very high mass items that you need for your missions, possibly a crewed mission to Mars. Uh, items like oxygen sensors, like um, uh, entry vehicles, like, you know, rovers, like, like habitats, you know, you have more space for that. And so that's really what's game changing about, about Lofted. Trudy, do you have any other um, uh, exciting things to say yeah. about Lofted? Yeah, so this technology was uh, a good decade in the making, um, and uh, it's been studied for quite a long time. Uh, this particular test article is six meters in diameter, uh, about 20 feet across, um, so that's what we tested. Um, it can withstand temperatures about to, to almost 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, about 2,900 is the max. Um, I think uh, I think they expected it to be see about 2,600 uh, degrees Fahrenheit on this on this uh, flight test. Um, and as as Tanya said, uh, it compacts um, into a smaller space, can fit well inside of a fairing. Um, I believe it can. Uh, I believe that the lifetime of the test article from inflation and deflation, because there's a few inflations on the ground they have to do to test it out. So we do ex extensive testing on the ground with all of our technology demonstration missions. It goes through as many environmental tests as it, as it possibly can. As anything we can simulate on the ground, we are going to test it on the ground to reduce risk that it that it succeeds in during its um, environmental flight test. Exactly. Um, and so we did a lot of ground testing and I think it can inflate and deflate around six times a total. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so um, what other particulars I'm trying to think of that, that you'd be interested in. Um, so this, this test article, uh, I believe could bring, could bring back. So you have to think of it as an upside down parachute, you know, it doesn't, it, you know, it, it kind of, it protects the thing behind it and it can uh, bring back, I think on the order of like 1,000 to 2,000 pounds of mass. Um, we do need to scale this up for future technologies um, and, or I'm sorry, future needs, um, really on the order of 50,000 pounds for some applications. Um, and to do that, we're talking test articles in the future that would be on the order of like 12 feet, uh, I'm sorry, 12 meters in diameter and 18 meters in diameter of scale up for different, again, applications. Um, and this was a great partnership. Lofted was a great partnership with the company uh, United Launch Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, they are developing and are near, near ready to launch uh, their next launch vehicle Vulcan. And they're looking at this to bring back their first stage, in, first stage engines from Vulcan mm -hmm. and to do a mid-air recovery even so that they never hit the water. Um, or or never hit land. They they mid air they they recover them mid air, and are able to um, take them back, refurbish them, salvage them, and it's a big cost savings for for them. Then it becomes a big cost savings for their customers, and and we're one of those customers. Um, so that's how you reduce ac um, the cost of access to space, the cost of launches it are, are things like this. And that's a very practical application. And then for NASA, its future missions would be landing uh, large scale masses on, on Mars, much larger than we're landing now with rovers. Um, uh, 
so large scale cargo um, and and potentially humans um, even uh, someday in the future. So when you think about to me about when you think about Artemis um, and the progression of that as we go into the future, um, these are the types of capabilities that you know without them some of our some of our future missions are not possible the things we're talking about now as an agency those things that are on paper are not yet feasible technology wise so that is the importance of investments in technology demonstrations like this we do a lot of the you know non recurring engineering um, we we do we take care of the costs that a lot of even companies don't have in their in their um, research and development kind of budgets to do and we partner with them it's very i think um it's very synergistic and very kind of symbiotic and how we do these things um so what we're doing today with these investments we help ourselves later and when we're able to go back and buy these things at a at a, a cheaper cost uh, to ourselves um and we gain capabilities we don't we don't currently have yeah that's so fascinating i know um the idea of just keeping uh, cost down, obviously, and that reusability factor is so important as we proceed towards all of these missions. Um, and the I, I, that's so fascinating. So you said six times you think that they would be rated to be reused. So is the idea then that you know, let's say with with the Vulcan engines coming back, is the idea then that the engines would be you know inside this little shield, uh, it'd come in and it would splash down uh, in the water, like the actual shield would splash into the water, or would it be caught in like another raft of some sort or would it float i suppose and then they'd pick up the whole thing in the water with the engine inside so i think the idea is to do a mid-air recovery by helicopter so it never touches the water so right, it grabs okay. it yep that's and for the other types of cargo that might be used for as well the same thing it would always be a mid-air recovery not not necessarily no i i think i think in that case then it would have some parachutes that slow it down through that kind of subsonic regime um hot um the high end technology can um, take the velocity from like say a Mach 29 to about a Mach 0.7. Um, so you still have to slow it down after that with parachutes and then land it where you're going to land it. But no, I, I don't expect that we'll have midair recovery for all of our applications. And then once that happens though, and it is recovered, then theoretically you could reuse it a few more times maybe if it's rated for six inflations. I believe so. I believe yeah. so. If you find that, if you find you have to inspect it, of course, that's what we're doing yes. now with Lofted. The test article is on its way back to Virginia to Langley Research Center where it was <laughs> developed and they'll inspect it. They'll, they'll, and, and you know, one of the things with this particular flight test was they have to look at what damage was caused just by re-entry, by temperatures or mm -hmm. the velocity reduction that had to go through the forces it sees versus what was what was caused by any splashdown in the water. They have to discern that from, from this flight test. Or also the, just... the helicopter recovery too. I'd imagine if you're swinging a hook around, you don't want to puncture something inflatable, right? <laughs> in the future, if yeah, once that's done, you'd have to look at all of the aspects of operations to see where might the damage have occurred mm -hmm. before you can determine, like you said, if you can research certify it for future use. Yeah. Yeah. A real, real quick question, just to clarify for some people watching. Um, we're not just looking at CGI presentations about what we're going to do with Lofted. I mean, Lofted has already launched and has already come back, right? There's, there's a video about this. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Like this actually shows Lofted being recovered after it went correct. around the Earth one time and then re-entered the atmosphere and splashed down at sea, correct? Correct. Correct. That's not a cartoon. That is not artist rendition. That is actual. Yeah. That's what actually happened a week and a half ago. Yeah. I love this because uh, it's got like a hand on it. Like somebody is grabbing a hold of it. <laughs> like while well, they're wearing a helmet camera or something. And this is it. Com or that was it coming down with uh, with a parachute as well. I believe is that right? Yes, that's the uh, infrared imagery as you see it uh, um, approaching the ocean. There it comes. So something that I'm really kind of curious about then is this actual, uh, you said the flexible thermal protection system. So this fabric, I, I suppose, this outer layer um, that has the ability to withstand all of this temperature, you know, this crazy uh, amount of friction that's coming in through the atmosphere. What's that actually made out of? This uh, woven protection system. <laughs> um, you know, Trudy, I can't remember that 
actual the actual name of it. Um, it's a Zylon. It's a Zylon um, material mm -hmm. that it, that makes up the netting and the kind of web uh, web material you see on it. Um, mm -hmm. Very strong. Uh, when it's inflated, it's um, uh, extremely rigid. Uh, it, it really almost acts like, as a like, like you would a, a rigid metal structure. Um, that's how that's how the, the strength of it. Um, Absolutely. I think, you know, Trudy, when you're um, if you were to knock on it, this is what to me is so amazing about this material. If you were to, if to, to just knock on it, it would sound as if you're knocking against steel. I mean, it's it's it is it is it's amazing, wow. uh, you know, when it when it is put together. So. You know, it is not like a a bouncy castle. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to rent it out for birthday parties or anything, right? <laughs> right. That might uh, hurt. It sounds like, geez, if you jump on something like that, that that's hard. Geez. Uh, but that's that's really interesting, though, that that a material. I mean, this is the stuff NASA does, right? You come up with these fabrics that do uh, incredible things like that. Do you think this is um, a material that then might be looked at to... I don't know, somehow coat actual, you know, spaceships too. If, if it's not just, um, you know, something like lofted coming in this inflatable thing. Um, I mean, you know, I work with a space shuttle, you know, right. <laughs> so they had, you know, the thermal protection tiles and everything underneath it that, you know, it comes in belly flopping basically. So do you think that this material is something that could be looked at to use on actual structures as well that are coming in too? Absolutely. And these this type of research has been going on for quite some time, uh, Alicia. And, and, you know, even though, you know, in TDM, where, um, you know, one of the things that we love to say is that, you know, technology drives exploration. You know, we're, we're advancing those technologies that are going to help us with our exploration goals, our future mission plans, you know, really enabling the nation uh, and the agency. Um, but, you know, another huge objective for, um, for NASA um, is, um, is that we directly align um, for uh, space tech programs like TDM, we directly align with NASA's strategic goal, you know, to develop technologies that will improve the quality of life on Earth you know, uh, be for the benefit of all mankind. And, um, a, you know, a prime example of this is uh, a potential spinoff technology um, from the flexible heat shield material that was developed for Lofted. And so NASA um, previously with uh, USDA, the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, actually developed a prototype uh, to improve fire shelters um, to help protect firefighters using the exact same materials that are used in lofted. And that's just one, one example of, um, of you know, what uh, the benefits of, of this material. Um, but so many different um, applications, um, you know, that can be used, but that's just one of them. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. That is really cool. All these things that NASA comes up with that we do use here on Earth. That is a, the best argument when people say, why are we spending all this money launching stuff into space? We use it here on Earth, too. That's the answer, guys. That's what it is. Um, so Lofted was really um, created in partnership with with a number of uh, other divisions as well, right? I mean, you had, um, you know, people working on the instrumentation on board. You had the, the fiber optic sensing systems, the temperature sensors and everything. What's it like working so cross division, you know, being able to to do that with with all of your other colleagues and other divisions as well? Well, you know, that's one of the I think one of the goals of, of space tech is that, you know, we're, we're certainly looking for, um, you know, true public private partnerships to, um, you know, enable these technologies. Um, and and you know move move us forward, um, and Lofted is just a prime example of that uh, public private partnership with NASA and with United Launch Alliance or or ULA, and you know um, the the primary project team for Lofted is out of NASA Langley uh, mm -hmm. in Virginia, and we've had significant con contributions um, from other field centers like uh, NASA Armstrong. Uh, like NASA Ames, uh, right here at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, who led the avionics uh, for Lofted. Um, just a true, true public-private partnership. And then, of course, we had other, um, you know, U.S. vendors who uh, supported 
um, uh, this uh, Jackson Bond um, out of, out of uh, I believe it's New Hampshire, correct me if I'm wrong, Trudy, um, who supported the um, flexible uh, heat shield material, helped uh, build the aeroshell uh, for us. So just, just a, a true public-private partnership. And so, um, you know, one of the, again, one of the goals is to help support U.S. industry to enable them to help um, make that, that access to space um, easier, easier for all. Yeah. So let's see, um, are there any questions to us? Oh, yeah. There was, I was actually getting ready to put on my camera and raise my hand because uh, there's a lot <laughs> of questions that people have coming through, have been coming through with. Um, folks, remember, if you have a question, you can tag us in chat or you can just put your question, put the word question in. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you tag at NASA Spaceflight to get your question into our question software. But uh, we do have quite a few. And I think the biggest one that I'm seeing here is that we might have some Moose fans in the chat, either that or Kerbal Space Program players. So some people were asking, quite a few people actually, asked if a person was on the other side of the lofted heat shield, could they have rode it down? And this of course goes back to an old concept, uh, man out of space easiest in the early days of NASA getting people out of space where they were like, how could we get an astronaut down just the astronaut part um, with actually an inflatable heat shield that barely fit a person. Um, so I don't think that was a design goal of lofted, right? But Similar though. <laughs> how, how did the temperatures or how did the environment behind the heat shield Shield compared to the environment in front of the heat shield? Maybe if we frame it that way. Mm. So I do think that we have some um, analysis to do on mm -hmm. all of the data that that come that is going to come in from lofted. Right. Um, very, the only, you know, preliminarily all I'll say is, and I said this, I think, you know, last week talking to some media, uh, which is, it, the goal of any of these technology demonstrations is to see, does it work? Right. And the answer we got so far was yes, it inflated. Mm -hmm. It um, it was oriented properly. It came yep. down through the atmosphere. It didn't break up upon seeing the high temperatures or melt mm -hmm. or anything you know like that. It withstood all of that. Um, so preliminarily, uh, the concept, you know, works. Right. Uh, but there's a lot of data reduction and data analysis that we need to to do, and that is going to take the course of the next many months um, to to do and look at the sensors and um, mm. and look at the various uh, instrumentation that right. we have have on the heat shell to to see uh, what what it was, you know, what, what the results were of that. What it was like. I'll, yeah, I'll say though too when the question of can could someone have ridden it down like a roller coaster? So, you know, like a, <laughs> on the back of it. <laughs> right. I mean, it depends on what exactly you're talking about by riding it down. I mean, you would need your own life support systems right. behind <laughs> that. You couldn't just grab on and be like, like you know, hold on to it. Yeah. in like it's a roller coaster or anything. Be like, no, that, that would that would not be good right. for you. Um, but... But certainly we are looking at it to to land humans eventually on planetary surfaces that do ah. have atmospheres. So that is the thing about lofted is it needs an atmosphere because you have to create drag on the vehicle to slow it down. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so on those planets, you know, the moon, you don't you don't need a loft. You're not going to use a loft. I've done okay. that in Kerbal. Like I've tried to go to the moon and use my parachutes to land on the moon. And you work out really quickly that that doesn't work very well. Oh. Like. <laughs> Yeah, Lacking an is atmosphere. This a video, is, is this a video game you're all talking yeah, about? Yeah, Kerbal Space Program okay. is a video game. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, and I, I, was, I was feel a little left out too, Trudy. I was like, <laughs> Moose? I guess it's like like are... Moose and Kerbal. I'm like, I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm, my kids, hold on. Let, let me go get my teenagers oh, and see if they can explain. We are going to have to play some <laughs> Kerbal together, I think. Uh, Kerbal okay. Space Program is a video okay. game that's based on real physics, oh, and it actually oh, has oh, a part oh, in the game that is an inflatable heat shield concept that looks almost exactly like lofted and you get what? the exact same things from it it folds up really small and then you get into space and when you're coming back down it expands so it has a lot more 
drag and it's better than a you know there's also it, that is a part in the video game wow. that is about real physics so wow. i didn't mean to uh catch y'all out the audience I feel like knows. that's gonna put yeah. us out of business i feel like I that's know, like a right? nasa going out of business no, I'm just kidding. we're <laughs> trying to surpri- so supply you with more engineers in the future yeah is what we're trying it's, to do. it's the engineers of the future it's the people that are going to be taking your jobs eventually really is i what do it like is. that there i you would go. like a succession plan so that i can retire <laughs> sooner than later i i will say this too and, and at some point we we could talk about that but it's kind of going totally off on a different topic mm-hmm. i do I, I do have a concern are we graduating enough engineers in this country are we graduating mm-hmm. enough in the stem you know area do kids shy away from these things for whatever reason? Um, I, I, I see it even with my own kids who are very good at math and science and still shy away from, right. you know, some of these types of things. And so um, that is a concern of mine. If video games will get people interested in, in it and applying to, you know, curriculums yeah. where I'm all for it. So yep. keep on doing your video games that are really cool. They sound cool. Yeah, anyway. it is. It's really cool because it's based on real physics. So so it's not like, you know, swipe to get to orbit or anything like that. Right. You know, those sorts right, of games. Right. It's very much like a calculate the delta V given this amount of fuel and this amount of non-fuel dry mass and this type of engine right. with this ISP. Like the game calculates all that. So it really does inspire. That is educational right there. That That is educational. I yep. like it. Uh, I'm I about like to load it. up Kerbal. We'll just play Kerbal for the rest of the show here. <laughs> we'll build Lofted in Kerbal. Like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Um, I do. I do have more questions here, though. We could we could talk about that for an hour. Um, right. As a disclaimer, I've played that video game for somewhere over eight thousand hours. I used to do it for a living. Like I played wow. Kerbal Space Program online for a living, wow. teaching people the basics of physics and rockets and stuff like that. So it, it is a real thing. It's not swipe to go I'm to space. Um, so wow. there was there was a question about uh, the type of lofted technology and how this sort of works out. Was this like is this a NASA thing where NASA owns this inflatable heat shield design now, or was it NASA funding a private company that then designed that like happens sometimes? Where does that sort of fall on the chain of whose tech is that? Trudy, go ahead. Yeah, Yeah. no, NASA, this was the brainchild of some NASA um, engineers. Um, NASA Langley does own the um, IP rights intellectual property for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we work with companies who are trying to use the same technology and license it, you know, from us. And so we work out our lawyers get involved and work out data rights and things like that. Um, and that's how we, without disclosing too much about sure. lofted, it, you know, we're in the middle of some things on that, yep. but that's how we do those things. But it just, it just depends. I mean, sometimes the ideas come from, from NASA, not all the time. Um, and I, and I'll tell you, NASA has really embraced this, uh, this thought that I, good ideas can come from anywhere. Mm-hmm. I've, I've never mm-hmm. seen the crowdsourcing that we do. We do these, uh, these challenges, prizes and challenges. We have a whole program around um, public prizes and challenges that we do when NASA's like, hey, we need this problem solved. You guys help us. And we put these out. Mm-hmm. You guys should go look at our our website on these things. And, and we put them out uh, quite frequently. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I would tell you earlier in my career when I started, I've been with the agency for a long time. Um, we didn't used to do that. We didn't embrace that philosophy, and it's very much a part of the culture and what we what we uh, do now. So I don't know if Tanya wants to add any more to that, but no, no. Uh, uh, I I think you 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 hit that, um, uh, Trudy, and. I think what's, uh, and if I could go back to one of the points, if you don't mind, Das, just, sure. just sort of shifting back to where we were before and talking about lofted and, and actually landing, um, you know, on a on the surface. I, I, I What I love and what I just think is so, so amazing about it is, you know, naturally when a, when a spacecraft is approaching uh, the surface of, um, of a planet, you know, it starts going extremely fast. I mean, you know, it is it is coming in hot. Yep. Um, and that's because the planet's gravity is is pulling it in. Um, but of course, we want the spacecraft to land safely, right? Yep. So we have to completely slow it down. And and as Trudy said before, you know, the the heat shield really helps overcome um, uh, that drag and help slow it down before it touches and it counteracts the pull of gravity specifically. And so it slows down the spacecraft, but 
Heat shields can actually slow an entry vehicle going 10,000 miles per hour to about 1,000 miles per hour in 60 seconds. Wow. Um, wow. It's just um, amazing. It's like seriously slamming on the brakes by, I guess, slamming into <laughs> right. the atmosphere, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I just wanted to get that in because yeah. I just think that's such a cool aspect of of heat shield. And it's, it's such a big thing and we try to use that lots of different places like even on the way out to Mars because when you get there you need to slow down, right? We don't want to poke our way over to Mars at 10 miles per hour. It would take us forever to get there. So we want to mm -hmm. be going really fast as we approach it and the closer we get the, the more the planet sort of pulls on us, right? But we have to slow down and actually stop on the surface of Mars. Nobody wants a rover that turns into rover vapor when it hits at 100,000 miles per hour or something like that, right? Exactly. So you've exactly. got to slow down and in order to do that, that you have to expend energy somehow you can carry fuel along and then you can point your engine backwards and burn your fuel and slow down that way um, you've seen parachutes happen before but the parachutes might get ripped off if you're going too fast and you deploy them too soon um, we've talked about heat shields but when we go into the atmosphere of the planet like that it really gives us the ability to sort of get free deceleration i say free mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but using the atmosphere instead of trying to use fuel or something like that means that we can slow our spacecraft down to where we can use the shoots or something and heat shields right. are why we can do that right absolutely absolutely i've got this little model here yes. of of our little lofted um lofted heat shield and um you know what i know you're showing pictures of it re of re retrieved on the boat right yep um but i was listening to the engineers and part of the team talking about lofted and how it looked so pristine, right, Trudy? I mean, they were saying that it almost looked like it could be reused again, mm -hmm. coming in um, and surviving those entry. Um, I think they they certainly saw a little bit of uh, charring and and probably with the um, this nose uh, part coming in first uh, through the through the atmosphere. But um, I'm excited to hear it's probably going to take a good year um, for the full analysis to take place for for lofted, but um, we are all just so, so um, pleased um, at how uh, at how it performed. Yeah, they are saying that they did use that word pristine. They are saying it looks pretty good. And um, back to Tanya's point about landing, which is cool. I didn't I didn't even know uh, the the fact that the that that um, that you mentioned. But the other thing with with um, this type of technology, because it slowed up, slows down faster, you can use it to land at higher elevations. And one thing mm -hmm. we learned with Mars 2020, um, which is the Perseverance rover that's that's on Mars now, that also technology demonstrations had um, quite a bit of, of um, uh, we had some technologies on that too, and I can talk about that in a minute if you'd like, but um, we've learned, it's very important for our colleagues our, and the science mission director at the scientists who are looking at these things and the principal investigators who aren't necessarily even, you know, part of NASA. We get our principal investigators from academia and other places. It's very important for them to try to land as close to the scientific um, um, area that they think is worth studying for many reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to traverse the um, a planetary surface is much more difficult. It's very difficult. And so the closer you can land, it, it benefits them. Um, so I think the high end technology opens up some of that too, just like a technology that we just tested out on Mars 2020 called terrain relative navigation, which is a system of uh, sensors and algorithms that we used for the very first time on Mars 2020 to pinpoint a landing spot that the scientists wanted us to see us land at. And, and it does triangulation and, and it um, has onboard maps and it knows where certain hazards are. So it's hazard avoidance, but it's also optimizing where you're going to land. And it pinpointed that landing spot, I was told, um, within six seconds. Wow. Um, and, and sure enough, that's where it landed. And it was another huge success. It was the very first time we've used that as well. Um, that is not typically standard for us. Usually we do use a system and a technology um, on a demonstration type mission where it does, it's not primary to the mission. If it fails, it fails. And it does, it's like a do no harm, you know, type mm -hmm. of type of thing to the, the primary mission. But TRN certainly was used for that, um, for that mission and, and, and quite successfully. So 
that that was another thing and just talking about the lofted um uh the Hyatt technology and and where it can help you land reminded me of TRN. I wanted to just yeah. mention that too. So yeah. Re really quickly, y'all might be able to help us decide something here. Um we always sort of argue back and forth with the viewers if something has landed or not, right? And lofted to splash down in the water. But is it still officially a landing when you splash down in the water, or is it like a watering? We'd let NASA leave that definition up here. Like y'all, y'all's decision. Tell us what the right terminology to use is. Hmm. A watering. I've never, I've never heard the watering. You've a never water. heard of watering. Okay, so watering. it is still officially per NASA a landing if you land in the water. Water in the water? water. I don't know. Tanya, I've never heard watering for a landing. Have you? It's just landing. I've never heard of that. Never okay. heard water of that. landing. It's a water landing. It's a we, water. Okay, water, water landing. Water <laughs> landing. Also, too, I have to question possibly, I think you have a great audience. I can't see them. I don't know who's out there. They're here. But I, I'm not sure what kind of time people have on their hands if they're worried about watering versus land. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to tell them that. Next time somebody argues about that, I'm going to be like, you all have way too much time on your hands, folks. <laughs> I, would, I would not worry about that, and I'd go play the video game. That's what I would use my time there for. You go. Would, Excellent. There you go. Um, go play I, the video game. I also want to bring <laughs> – go ahead, Alicia. Oh, no, I wasn't saying. Go ahead. Um, I also I want to bring – oh, wait. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Um, I did have one thing I wanted to say, say, Doss, uh, with um, my previous uh, my previous career before coming into uh, TDM uh, was I was a materials engineer um, and working pretty much high temperature materials. And so I supported the solid rocket boosters for shuttle and then, you know, supported SLS until I left about five years ago. So, uh, you know, two minutes into launch, our boosters are, are peeling off and landing into the water. So um, I'll fight anyone who says that, you know, a water landing <laughs> isn't a true landing. <laughs> there you go. Did you hear that? Tanya says that it is a landing. Um, there you go. <laughs> I appreciate a that. A landing. And, and, I'm, and I'm just going to say, Tanya is the most gentle, kind person I've ever met. So if she says I'll fight you, I mean, that gives that serious business. That is serious. Because she is, there's not a, a any kind of violent bone in her body. So oh, that's, that's funny stuff. And you know what? Well, Tanya, it's funny too, because... Um, it seems like eons ago, but I used to work Orion as well, the, the capsule that's mm -hmm. up there now that's getting ready to orbit the moon. And I was responsible for working um, with our corporate partner, Lockheed Martin, the prime on Orion with the, on the test and verification plan for that. Um, so uh, it, again, it was many moons ago, but it, it, a, a lot of us at NASA, we move around to a degree. Sometimes we're working mm -hmm. human exploration. Sometimes we're work, work science missions and, space technology and and um and so it, yeah you find that sometimes you move around in your career and it benefits you working on the test and verification plan for something helped me come over here and work on technology demonstrations which is by and large a test program mm -hmm. um but if if you're if you're monitoring what's going on orion with orion now and something doesn't work don't don't mention it to me don't just i i had nothing to do with it i had nothing to do with it <laughs> All right, it's we can really get back cool to that you guys got to like jump around though. This really must have been quite a week for you. Just all of your projects doing all of the things. That's really, really I, I used to I used to work closely with the the engineer who came up with the um, encapsulated service module uh, concept mm -hmm. with the fairings on the outside that separated. And when um, and when the fairings separated, I sent him a congratulatory email. I haven't worked with him in it seems like eons. Um, but you still remember those days and you remember those people. And I, I remember the brilliant ones I've worked with, you know, there's so many of them, but I, it's just mm -hmm. hard to forget some of the people who um, come up with these concepts. And I, I have the most admiration just uh, and respect for, for those folks. So yeah, just yeah. staying up till the middle of the night. And, and I didn't stay up all night. I waited for like, I don't know, fairing separation. And then I, I don't know, went back <laughs> to sleep or something, but yeah, we do, a lot, we get to do a lot of cool things, Alicia in our jobs. I'll say that. Absolutely. It's a lot. Totally. It's cool a thing. great time to be working for NASA. That's for sure. Great yeah. time. Great so time. actually talking about that then with the 
the way that it was sent up with the fairing separations and, and everything with it being packaged then with JPSS2, was that intentional then? Is this like, was it planned long in advance? Like, oh, these two are going to go together. Or was it like, oh, there was some extra room and this thing's a little squishy right now. Like it'll fit nicely. How was that decided to kind of partner with that for that mission? Um, I'll start and then Tani can jump in and um, it was, it's been planned for a long time. It was planned about four years ago um, and they had extra mass. They could take us along um, and it worked out uh, with um, uh, being attached to the centaur. Uh, and so what, you know, um, a lot of times what happens in technology demonstrations is we try to keep them on the lower cost side, which means we're looking for rides to space. Mm -hmm. And um, we look around for what's out there. NASA has something called a flight planning board that meets um, regularly. And uh, we brought it up to a flight planning board um, meetings and we asked what's out there. You know, what is flying in this approximate time frame? what what might work um we need you know this mass and they they said that that works for us um it, so really it came about through conversation and discussion and collaboration and and talking about these things and um, it materialized that way so yes it's planned long in advance um and uh the particulars of it worked out and it's it's those are some difficult particulars when mm -hmm. you have interfaces for power and structure and um mm -hmm. electrical um uh thermal all kinds of requirements for your payload um those aren't necessarily easy things to find because sometimes they're pretty unique um but yeah yeah it worked out great for us that that jpss2 partnership and with noaa Absolutely. Nothing to add. Nothing right. to add to that. Uh, I, I think that um, what's really also really pioneering about this whole, and not pioneering because you said it's been around for a while, I guess this idea of the inflatable, the high -end technology mm -hmm. though, um, that was really something, the first time for me anyway, really, that I'd seen something demonstrated in such just a, a really fascinating, graceful sort of way was with JWST, right? You had those huge solar arrays that were packaged up real tight, like origami, you know, and then <laughs> spread out later. So something that is inflatable or expandable later on, it really does help being able to package everything nice and tight to save space, because space is definitely um, something that they don't have the luxury of. I say space, that's funny, because it's going into space. But the, yeah. the extra space in your thing to go into space, um, that's really, really important. So Lofted is the, I hope the first of of many of these. It's it was really cool that video. I think we have too of it. You know, expanding to, it's stunning just how large it is. It's what 20, uh, 20, 20 meters is it or 20, 20 feet six meters twenty feet, 20, yes. yes yeah twenty feet across uh, mm -hmm. and it, when it's all kind of collapsed inside itself and, and real tiny is that it's much smaller. It's how yes. big is that? I want to say what's in my head right now, don't hold me to it, uh, but I think it's four by four by seven feet. Is that about? Is that that's about right. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's what I'm recalling too is four feet across from 20 to four. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's a big deal. That's amazing. So yeah. tell us about some of the other things that you all are working on then. Lofted. 100%. Great job. Uh, you know, we're so excited to see all of the information as it comes in uh, to, to, to see the future applications of this as well. What are some of the other things you're working on now for the future? So, Trudy, <laughs> um, well, you know, one of the one of the missions that we have, we actually have a few that are coming up, um, I would say. Um, in 2023. Um, one of them that we're really excited about is our Deep Space Optical Communications, or DSOP for short, and that's led by um, one of our teams out at NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory, and mm -hmm. it will, um, you know, continue to help revolutionize um, um, the data rates that we get further out into space. Um, you know, and it's um, it kind of like, it's almost like in, in many ways, it's in our, um, we have technology thrust areas and optical communications is one of those thrust areas. And as a matter of fact, just if I could um, jump back a little bit, but back in December, 
of 2021, we launched um, laser communications relay demonstration, and that was TDM's first optical communications uh, demonstration, um, which, which of course was to sort of supplement the radio frequency way that we send data back to earth. This is a um, kind of a new and improved um, um, optical communications using lasers that um, um, could help um, you know, take data um, from various spacecrafts and, you know, send it into um, that the um, LCRD spacecraft and then down to Earth in one of our one of our two ground stations that we used um, for the LCRD demonstration. And so DSOC is kind of a, um, um, you know, an, another aspect of that optical communications, moving that technology even further. Um, and we are launching with a, a, another host spacecraft. It's the Psyche mission, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, managed out of NASA's Science Mission Directorate. And we talk about partners. We have external partners, but we also have internal partners. Um, and that's a huge mission with NASA Science Mission Directorate. Um, Arizona State University, which provides the PI um, for Psyche, and it's the um, uh, heading out to an asteroid called Psyche, um, which um, I love when I love to talk about scale. And this asteroid is about the size of Massachusetts, about the size of Massachusetts. And so um, it'll be going out to um, that asteroid to see if um, um, there's a metal core. Um, in the in the Psyche asteroid, and so there's all types of instrumentation on on the spacecraft um, to to take samples and verify verify that. But DSOC will be catching a ride um, um, on the Psyche mission, and so we're we're extremely excited about, about that. Yeah, we've I think many of us have been following what's going on with Psyche uh, and all of that <laughs> coming up. It, it is really right. really cool. It is. It is. Trudy, I didn't know if you had anything else you want to add about. Yeah. About, yeah. 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 So, so Tanya's right. Optical comm is big for us. I mean, imagine that, you know, the, the communication, the technology used by, you know, Neil Armstrong to say that's one small step for man. That's one. It's the same. It's the same. That's the baseline technology we're still using mm -hmm. today is radio frequency communication. Mm -hmm. And um, to bring in another type of communication technology and, and um, be able to do bi-directional and increase our data rates mm -hmm. um, and be able to, um, uh, to, to, yeah, just have a more efficient way of communicating mm -hmm. is going to be really important for us for the future. So the, the one up there now that's operating for about the next two years doing various, running various um, experiments back to ground couple of ground stations we have one in California one in Hawaii that they're mm -hmm. communicating with and then back up then we're going to put a terminal on the um, space uh, international uh, space station uh, mm -hmm. called Aluma T and then we'll be able to communicate from our LCRD payload that's in geosynchronous orbit or, or orbit to mm -hmm. the space station to this um, terminal and to the ground and back so that's the relay which, mm -hmm. that's the mm -hmm. relay yeah so that's what we're doing um, so that's all very important. Another, I'll just mention a couple of important areas for us. Um, satellite servicing is another big area for us um, in space, um, servicing assembly and manufacturing. So being able to make, for example, um, uh, the next great telescope that we do, it, making it in space instead of making it on the ground, going through all the testing you do on the ground and then launching it, launch all the materials you need and make it up there. So that's mm -hmm. one concept. Um, the servicing part of that is if you have an asset on orbit that gets into any kind of trouble, you could go and fix it, or you could refuel it, or you could augment it, or relocate it, a number of things you could do. So like a toolkit in space, we're mm -hmm. working on that technology as well. Um, industry is very interested in that. Other government agencies are very interested in that. Mm -hmm. Huge effort for us right now. We have two major projects in that launching in the 25-26 timeframe. Um, uh, for those capabilities. And then the other one I'll mention is cryogenic fluid management. Um, it's another big area for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to reduce uh, <clears throat> boil off uh, for the, the fuels that we use mm -hmm. um, on orbit uh, is another big area uh, for us. So storage transfer and mass gauging um, are kind of, you know, sub elements of that uh, overall uh, umbrella of kind of capability area that working on. 
Um, and then nuclear, nuclear power and propulsion is huge for us right now. And all the formulation we, or work we have going on in that right now, um, uh, that'll be big. You know, how to survive uh, uh, on the lunar surface with power needs that you have. Um, a fission surface power system is going to be, you know, important for that. Uh, and the nuclear thermal or nuclear electric propulsion are things we're, we're talking about now and looking at. So a lot of different uh, capability, huge, huge capability as areas for us that were yeah. that are in our portfolio that Tanya and I get to, to work on. And um, yeah. there's a lot to do. I, I, I'm looking at uh, questions in chat here and I would just, I want to roll something up for everybody that is watching right now, right? We're talking about DSOC and, and these communications, new to communications technologies, and it's literally things that you may have heard about in science fiction that this team is working on and making fact. Like you watch The Expanse, right? And they're like, oh, let's open up a tight beam to whoever, right? And they're talking about this point-to-point -point communication, it's a laser in The Expanse. That is literally what DSOC is. It is using lasers to communicate and on a tight beam. You could call it a tight beam if you wanted to, um, from one point to the other where you take all the energy in your transmitter and you focus it into a laser beam and you send it to one point instead of uh, RF, like radio waves. When we communicate with our spacecraft using radio waves, we sort of like bleh, just send radio out in this big wide pattern and the spacecraft sort of gets it and it's like bleh, and it sort of sends it back. I mean, we try to tune it and we have like narrower beams there, but if you can do that with lasers and you're able to establish the link and send all your comms on a laser beam, you've heard about it in science fiction. That's literally what y'all are working on. I got that right, right? I didn't make that up. No, that's how Tanya and I talk about it. If if we were awesome. in front of an audience right now, that's what we would say to each other. It'd be like, Tanya, you know that bleh communication we have? That's you know, we're trying to make that better. We gotta that's fix how that. exactly on a daily basis how Tanya and I talk about it. How did you know? We need to how open a tight beam to Palomar. Yeah, we need to open that let's get that broadband tight beam to Palomar and download the data like I could see y'all on the movie movie screen, right? Yes, I love it. But I love it. the point I want to make is is y'all are literally working on technologies that currently only really or maybe only exist in science fiction or, you know, we've heard about them because of science fiction and we've read books and we've watched movies and you work with making those things real or even more available or testing them or whatever, right? Right, right. And, you know, you just reminded me, um, you know, when I started off, um, as a high school student, I was fortunate enough to be in a high school, a program for high school students here at, at Marshall Space Flight Center nice. um, called NASA Sharp Summer High School Apprenticeship Research Program and a uh, huge program. And and um, it's it's been kind of full circle for me because, you know, part of that program, you come in, you get assigned to an engineer or a scientist and you do a project for about six weeks and then present it. I mean, it's really cool for a high school student, as you can imagine. And yep. my very first project working in that was uh, optical data collection techniques and analysis. I mean, that was my project. And, uh, you know, I got to work with, uh, you know, lasers and, you know, setting up, uh, setting up the whole system on a, you know, on a um, hydraulic table and, and all of that. And, you know, to be you know, last December, almost a year ago, uh, to be launching, you know, laser communications relay demonstration, our optical comm was just, you know, I can't even describe, you know, how that felt. It yeah. was, it was, it was truly amazing. And so, you know, this, this, you know, and I won't say that my little, my little project was the precursor for, for LCRD, but you know, it's, it's in the class, it's in the class of, of, of that. And so, yep. you know, just instilling that, um those those techniques and and um you know that research um and just carrying it through through the career you know it it means a lot and you know and I, and of course it shows just you know nasa's commitment to you know trying to inspire and you know um really bring in the next generation of, of scientists and engineers that they continue to this day yeah it, it really is i mean you know we have a lot of technologies on the ground right things that get developed and tested and you know you can make laser communications on a hydraulic table in the lab or whatever but at some point somebody needs to do it in space because it's right. cooler when it's in space. And, and that's literally what you're doing, taking that concept and putting it in space, right? And then how can we use that in space, whether it's the, the lofted inflatable technologies? Who hasn't inflated like a, a pool raft or something? Well, this is like a pool raft in space, right? Um, what it looks like too, when it inflates, it actually really right. does look like that. Yeah. Right. It, it, yeah, because... Go ahead. Yeah, I hope... Well, no, I just want... I hope 
two things. Well, three things, you know, um, when we test things on the ground and I said, you know, we simulate as much as possible. Microgravity, yep. microgravity is the thing we cannot simulate here. We can do temperatures. We can do pressures mm -hmm. with thermal vacuum, cha yep. vacuum chambers. We can even put astronauts in a pool to try to give them the kind of motion that they'll go through. Um, but microgravity is one that you cannot simulate here uh, on Earth. And, yep. and the other thing is back to what you said earlier about, you know, we're doing things that, you know, you guys see in science fiction. I'll just say it depends on which science fiction. Um, <laughs> this is why this is why I do not watch space movies. My 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 husband knows I cannot watch space movies because I sit there and I go, that's not possible. What are they talking about? What is Sandra Bullock doing right now? In this Oh. space suit and like she's floating and so we're still we're still bound by the laws of physics right so i just want to say that like yes in our program but like if if you think we're going to beam someone up soon not not in my program not, it's not happening so, um i swear i i i i, I when i when... oops we might have a very brief I hiccup to, every session i do i get this question if i had to I don't watch them. Oh, we got you back. I don't. Okay, Trudy, we lost what? you for a second, oh. but you were talking about oh. uh, realistic. Oh, that I don't watch space movies. Yes, yes. And so I get the question all the time of what's my favorite, and I say I don't have one because I don't watch them. I swear them off. Like I've. Anyway, it sorry. Would, it would still make a fantastic show. Like if we were to watch them and then say, "What is this? Seriously, that's not how that works. That's not how any of this you know, works." Like yes, that would be good yes. content. You know that. You know that show where the little guys were in the corner and they would critique the movie. Yes, yes. yes. Mystery, Science Mystery Science Theater. Theater. Yes, yes. That's a great show. We need you guys. that for just. We need that for space movies, and we can sit there and critique and be like, "That's not possible. What are they doing?" Oh so my anyway. god, I'd watch that. All right, <laughs> I'll, I'll just I, I'll take all of our Zoom cameras and put it down at the bottom, and then I'll just make it like a black silhouette, and then we'll put a movie there on in the background, go. and we'll just yell at the movie. All y all those down? Reactions. All those <laughs> take reactions. Us way off track. I'm sorry. You can go back to it is, normal program. It is okay. It is absolutely mm -hmm. okay. I think a lot of us feel that way when we're watching a show mm -hmm. or something. We're like, they did what? What they redirected the power flux to the cyber cortex? Like seriously, that's not a thing. Like, <laughs> I think we would get along watching movies with y'all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Too funny. Oh geez. Do you have any more questions, Des? I do. I have a. I have an awful lot of very technical questions about um, Lofted, and I don't know if if we can even answer all these because they're still reviewing data and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But let me hit a couple of these really quickly. Um, this one might be a little bit more technical, but we know that when a spacecraft re-enters the atmosphere, sometimes it goes through like a comms blackout because the environment around the spacecraft, the plasma blocks our signals, right? And sometimes like when the space shuttle was coming back, we would have periods where we wouldn't be able to talk to them. And then Tedris mm -hmm. comes in and you can look up your tail cone and stuff like that and, and technology marches forwards, right? Um, but does having a larger surface, I guess, on the forward side of your re-entry make it easier to communicate with the spacecraft somehow? Maybe via an antenna looking out the back of the heat shield. Was there anything like that? Like, did you have comms blackout with Lofted when it was re-entering? I, Trudy, I don't think that they, um, I think that's, again, that's a part of what we will have to be, you know, looking at. Um, but, you know, there were a redundant, you know, um, communication you know, instrumentation on, on lofted the ejectable data recorder, which I think was so neat was like, it's like the size of a large lemon yep. um, that shot out um, and landed. And, and, you know, you had the ability, um, you know, the team of course had to go retrieve that. And I think it wasn't found too far from the, from the air shell Trudy um, right. when it landed. And, you know, we all laughed about it possibly getting, you know, swallowed by a whale <laughs> before, <laughs> before it was, um, there it is. The, there it is. That's the injectable, yeah, that's the injectable. So, you know, they'll be, they'll be, you know, reconstructing data and looking at, looking at all of that. Um, so, yeah. you know, more to come, more to, more to come on that. Yeah. And they had real time telemetry that I know um, mm -hmm. they were able to get um, back uh, during, you know, during the the um, demonstration. The comm you're talking about, I think, would be um, something. Uh, first of all, I can't answer it right now. Sure. Uh, we would we would have to, I think, understand more about the physics of, of all of that. And I'm sure that we have really smart people who are already thinking about what a 12 or 18 meter 
diameter um, heat shield and the, the comms blackout or not that you would see during that during that reentry phase. Um, but I don't have the answer to your question right now. Yeah. But that's but that's, like Tanya said, T, TBD on that one. It's it's absolutely fine because the the most the coolest thing for me is we're talking about something that you've done, right? We're talking about lofted. The spacecraft's gone up. It's come back down. The heat shield right. worked, and you recovered it. And now all these people in chat are saying, oh, does it help with this? Does it help with this? Like, there's all these ideas <laughs> that spring from this one test, and that yeah. is exactly how science and engineering works. You've That's proved right. that this works, yeah. and now all these other follow-up ideas. I guess we're going to need more lofteds or even larger heat shields, right? Right. We're going to need a bigger lofted. We're going to need a bigger lofted. <laughs> and then the shark's going to bite on it. Wait, that's a different movie we'll comment on. Um, right. No, but that, that really is awesome that you've dis you've demonstrated this one technology. And I want people to understand, it's not like, okay, now we're going to buy lofteds and start slapping lofteds on all these things, right? It's not specifically about exactly lofted. It is, does an inflatable heat shield work the way we think it does when we get... It's not ground truth, and then it landed in the water, so it's still not ground truth. Right. <laughs> we get ex real world right. experimental data. You're right, Doss. We wanted Air to truth. know, you know, could it slow down and survive reentry? Yep. I mean, that was that was question number one. And you know, from what we were able to see and recover, and and what we're looking at, you know, those you you've got the pictures. Yep. You know, it was able to to survive reentry, and so. You know, that's that's where we now, you know, because this is a scalable technology, this is where we'll take what we learned and hopefully, you know, scale it up. And I've heard the, um, you know, ULA executives say, you know, in terms of perhaps, you know, um, um, asset recovery, like yep. a you know, Centaur, a Vulcan engine. Yep. A Vulcan Smart reuse. Engine. They've talked about that a lot. Smart yep. reuse. Absolutely. That like they would probably want to start around a 12 meter. And, you know, again, what we tested with Lofted is a six meter. And yep. so, you know, um, they'll, of course, take the data and do with it what they need to. And NASA will take this data and do what we'll need to. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be all types of, of um, you know, applications and things coming out of coming out of this. Yep. I got I got I keep trying to bring this picture up. Um I have to yes. talk about this one more time because look at the backside here, right? Like look here at how pristine if I can actually draw on the screen. There we go. Um yeah. it doesn't look like it's been to space. It's so clean. It right. was protected, but normally there's like, you know, ch charring on the side of it and there's like flame scorch marks and it really looks like it's done battle with the atmosphere, right? But this right here that did a lap around the earth and came back down looks brand new. Yeah. Also, real quick, are these actually pool noodles down here? <laughs> they look like pool noodles to me. <laughs> What? They look like oh, pool noodles. Pool noodles. Like they went down to the big box store and bought a couple pool noodles, and they're suspending the lofted space. I'm okay with it. Like I'm all here for using pool noodles down there. That's that's highly technical ground support equipment. Dom. There you go. <laughs> highly that's technical ground support equipment that was designed by NASA Thank engineers. You. And you can and tell it's NASA blue and, even. And it, it probably is pool noodles is what I'm trying to tell you, because I don't think there's anything that's not, you know, there's, we're not above using pool noodles for, you know, cushioning it's, the test articles that we bring right, back. So. Right tool for the job, right? That actually yeah. does make me wonder something though. So right now you're testing it in water, right? You're splashing down. That is a nice kind of softer landing place. If this technology is used on Mars, then it, is the idea that it'll shield it and then, I don't know, come off and just go somewhere else? Or will it deflate and get sucked up into something? Or like, will it land on Mars and will it bounce? Like, what will it actually do after it slows everything down? I hope it doesn't bounce. I don't, it's not supposed to bounce. <laughs> it's not supposed to bounce. <laughs> it's not supposed to bounce. We talked about it not being a bouncy castle earlier, right? Well, yeah. The material, no, yes, yeah. but <laughs> it should it should just land its cargo. I mean, it, it should just land it. I, it's yeah, that's it, we would have to again give it help coming through the more subsonic regime. But Tanya, I don't know if you want to jump in here, but no, it's it's supposed to land its cargo. Yeah, safely, safely. <laughs> there you go, safely, which means no bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> 
it, it's cool because that sort of thing is for the next engineer to design. Like we know that the inflatable technology works and we know that it can withstand re-entry and we, we've proven all those things. And now you can take that and say, all right, say we use it on Mars. How do we get the rover off the top of it or, or whatever it is, like whatever the next thing is? Because step one is proving that it's like maybe step two is proving that it works. Step one is coming up with the idea. Getting funding mm -hmm. is somewhere in there. Um, but we you sort of understand that now the concept is sound, right? Right. And right. Open up all sorts of other opportunities. Yep. That's exactly mm -hmm. the point of a technology demonstration. And we've seen, Tanya and I have seen other demonstrations we've done yep. where we realized that um, we need a next version of it because mm -hmm. the technology mm -hmm. didn't exactly perform how we expected and there were issues and we need to do some redesign. Yep. You know, yeah. it's not uncommon for us to say we need redesign or we need to tweak this component. We have some sensitive components. We just flew a couple of years ago a... Um, a deep space uh, atomic clock, which is like GPS for space, you know, and um, has really sensitive uh, components in it that were hard to even test on the ground and um, found that it was, it worked actually quite well, um, performed quite well, but they know now from that, there are some tweaks they could make to it in the design that would make it more robust, um, mm -hmm. more reliable, and a next version of it would be probably the version that would be the usable version. So we find right. that often in technology demonstrations. I was very, when I first started in this program years ago, I was very pie in the sky about all this. I was like, oh, we're going One more brief comms blackout, I think. <laughs> going to demonstrate this one, but that's going to be it. We're going to go that way. It, it, yeah, and, and we've seen that happen a few times. Gotcha. That, I mean, that does make sense. It's it's part of the whole scientific method, right? Like if one little thing doesn't work or, or you have something else that you need to firm up or didn't quite design or perform the way you wanted it to, um, you don't just say, oh, well, it failed. Just throw it all away. You observe what happened and then you see how you can make changes. You improve it and you try again. That's literally how science right. works. It's how engineering That's right. works. That's so. right. And, and we walk a fine line because, you know, there's this phrase when you're when you're working, especially with the people who have designed this and put their life's you know, work into some of these concepts. We like to say bad, better is the enemy of good enough. And so you have to figure out where that line is. What's good enough mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. off and, you know, produce what are what what betterments do you need to make and and your kinds of, and and how much does it cost it's constantly that trade of yeah but right. to do this is going to cost so much x amount more yep. but we kind of, you know don't have so where can you where can you draw that line and then use it and it's it's tough that's a tough trade to make yep we still operate in the real world where we don't just ask the magical unicorn for our funding and the unicorn grants us all the space dollars we need or whatever yeah, we're still looking for it now. We're still, still looking, looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a question really quickly, and I, I don't actually know if you can answer this one for us, like if you're allowed to answer it. Um, what is inside the inflatable part of the heat shield? Is it like an inert gas? Is it just air? Like what, what was inside of that? Go ahead, Trudy. Yeah. <laughs> right, go ahead. You, you can, if you want. No, to you can. Um, <laughs> nitrogen? It's nitrogen. <laughs> it's an inert gas. Yes, okay. you're right. Nitrogen. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I was trying to, I was trying to, you know, build the, you know, excitement, and then she said nitrogen. Nitrogen. No big deal. <laughs> I didn't. It was. I didn't know how to build the excitement to say. I don't. I didn't. I. I totally failed on that one. I was like, was, we, we didn't. We didn't need I a big reveal. Up? Yeah, it's okay. Like, hold on. Hold on. There's a sign behind me. I'm going to turn this shit. No. There are, I will, there are other concepts, though, that we're looking at for other other gases to use for this. Um, they're not, they're not, um, we have not fully investigated all of them, but there are some other co concepts out there um, for different gases to use. And, and that's probably as much as I could gotcha. say about that. So. Makes sense. <laughs> Um, let's see. Again, I'm just, there's a hundred questions in there. I don't want them all to be too terribly complicated, but every now and then I'm just like, I don't know, is it nitrogen? I guess I sort of gave it away when I said inert gas. Um, <laughs> anyways. But, you know, speaking of, speaking of, um, you know, a gas, one of the, one of the two technologies that, um, 
was a uh, part of technology demonstrations um, on the Mars Perseverance rover. You know, we, Trudy talked about the terrain relative navigation, which was more of an operational technology that helped, you know, land that that awesome rover uh, yeah. on Mars. But we also had MOXIE, um, which is a Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, um, which is why we call it MOXIE, another <laughs> long name. We just love long names. Yeah, <laughs> But, um, you know, that's actually taking that thin atmosphere um, of Mars and, you know, it's, it's kind of like a it's it's a box <laughs> which has kind of like an electrolysis plant in it. There you go. That gold box that's pulling in the atmosphere and actually converting it to oxygen, uh, to usable oxygen. And we are now on our 12th oxygen run. I think this week, uh, the week this week of Thanksgiving will be the 12th. Um, oxygen run of MOXIE. And so, you know, certainly this is another scalable technology. And we are um, working with um, the folks at both uh, JPL and MIT, um, the, the contributors to this awesome uh, technology. And, um, you know, they have the freedom now, you know, while they're on Mars to look at several different uh, parameters, you know, what's the best you know, what's the, what's the best way to, to make this, um, you know, are you still making it in a, in a dust storm? You know, what, how, how pristine or how pure is the oxygen? You know, they're being able to test it all types of different ways. Um, and it's, it's um, escaping me right now. I think it's just lack of sleep. I'm sorry, guys, but I'm trying to remember how much total uh, breathable oxygen has been um, produced so far. And I'm sorry that it escaped me right now, but we are on our 12th run. So we're, we're super, super excited about the success of Moxie. That's amazing. I think it's been about, so they have produced 98% oxygen purity every single time, which was the mm -hmm. level one requirement we like to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to date they've produced about what would be the equivalent of 10 minutes of breathing um, air for a human being. So you could, you could live for about 10 minutes on the air that on the oxygen that Moxie has produced. So clearly you see the picture there um, mm -hmm. that DOS has up. Um, it went into probably about the size, maybe just of a car battery, maybe a little bit bigger than that, went into the rover. So clearly the scale up of this, just like, just like Lofted scaling it up, just scale up of this is a, is something that we have to consider. Right. Um, you'd need significant scale up to be able to produce the amount of oxygen that you need for either, bre either breathable air or, um, or fuel, rocket fuel, uh, mm -hmm. to, to make that. So, but it's a great first step. It's really the first step into all category of technologies we call in-situ resource utilization. That's yeah. what MOXIE is. What is and the turnaround it, time for turning it into breathable oxygen? Like, is the goal maybe that, I don't know, somebody could just strap one of, somebody could strap on one of these things and it could just constantly cycle out, you know, into breathable oxygen inside a suit or something? So right now, I think it takes. Oh, Tanya, what do you? I, I know it takes a while for the system to come up and get um, get ready to to um, kind of receive the carbon dioxide and then process it. I don't think it's a very quick process right now. I can't tell you exact times, um, but I would think that would be one of the ultimate goals. Um, but we're talking really large scale production. So I think of it almost as a plant, like a pl plant type production. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think of it as like backpack, you know, <laughs> EVA type of, I mean, it could maybe if they could scale it down. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we've just really been thinking, you know, scale up to yeah. this point, because the astronauts have suits, right, where where um, they can do extra ve vehicular activity. Mm -hmm. um, but we really need scale up with with Moxie. So right. yeah, but you ask a good question. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Any other stuff? Uh, I can continue asking questions the entire time here <laughs> if you'd like <laughs> me to. We we could probably go for another two hours asking all the questions yeah. I've got in the queue. Um, let's see here. 
I'm trying to make sure we, we don't revisit. A lot of people are asking the same sorts of things like, oh, could I ride this down? Um, <laughs> That's all people want to know. Is it rideable? A, Can yeah. we make a ride out of this? Quite a bit of conversation. That about... is being a very popular so, thing That's a theme park someday. You go yeah. up on a big elevator and then hop into a lofted shield and just like, wee, all the way back down. That'd be amazing. I was just going to say that. some theme park <laughs> needs to capitalize on this. Like I mm -hmm. live near, not far from Cedar Point. If people know where Sandusky, Ohio is, mm -hmm. it's like roller coaster capital of the world. They need some kind of high ed ride, I think. Anyway, <laughs> <Yeah>. crazy. <laughs> Oh, let's see here. If you have any other questions, folks, tag us in chat. But I am. I'm skipping quite a few here because we've talked about them a lot. Um, here's one. Okay, this is a good one. And a lot of the viewers are very interested in, not to name names, but larger shiny spacecraft, right? Um, and so that could be sort of a change. You're used to sort of riding along or having limited space or anything like that. And are there any ideas that you have that you haven't been able to do just because you haven't been able to have the space to do it? And if all of a sudden a big stainless steel spacecraft says, you can launch a tennis court, is there anything that you'd be like, wow, that's going to be useful? Or would you just launch a lofted size of a tennis court? <laughs> Anything like that in the queue that uh, space or volume constraints have made difficult to test so far that you can talk about? Well, there's lots of things in the queue that would be difficult to launch from the sheer size, like habitats and things like that, that right. we've looked at inflatable like habitats. I think I think that's what the question is. I'm not sure if I understood it completely, but I think there are things we're looking at that would be construction on orbit um larger scale um infrastructure needs that we have for for our future architectures mm -hmm. um tanya you can jump in here anytime too but mm -hmm. i mean that's kind of the thing i mentioned earlier about um in space manufacturing and and assembly right. um solar arrays you know i mean manufacturing and assembling those uh on orbit um antenna like someone mentioned com before um, uh, and kind of array antenna, that type of thing. We have a couple of demos now that we're gonna look at that. So, and then certainly the large scale or like larger scale structures that, that I mentioned, but right. Um, I think I understood, uh, maybe I didn't understand the full question, but yeah, yeah it's, it's just, it, they were specifically asking about Starship, right? The SpaceX Starship and the amount of volume that's available there that has been previously sort of uh, not attainable it's been really difficult to get that much volume into space and if starship works out there may be it may be a lot easier to get a lot larger things but that's where like you said scaling up some of the demonstrations you've done could make sense do you need a larger plant to make a lot of oxygen on mars well, you're not going to stick it on the back of a rover. You need bigger cargo area to get that to Mars. So a larger spacecraft like Starship might enable that. Um, do you need a larger heat shield for this big hab that's going to land on Mars? And it's inflatable. But when you have eight meters of space to work in, imagine how big the inflatable could be if packed it's eight meters or six meters, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think, again, it's the same sort of thing where y'all prove the concept there's an idea and the math works out and the physics seems like it should work out but you all get out there and you actually prove yes this concept works and now let's scale it up let's put it in production y'all are the sort of the front line there proving these ideas right yeah uh, yes absolutely and and you know i i personally you know love that model of because nasa so does so much of you know the first of you know, first, first this, first that, you know, and, and, you know, taking those, taking those concepts, taking those proven concepts um, and letting industry run with it. You know, I, I think that's just a, a, I think that's an amazing model and that's Tanya talking. Um, but I, but I think that that's, that's just a great model, yep. you know, that, that we are the pathfinders, you know, we, we find the way we prove those concepts and then, you know, um, and, and to the extent that industry is able to, you know, take those and, and run with them. I mean, that's a great point. You guys really are, you know, at the cutting edge of technology here. You are the ones doing all of this magic. Um, and actually to your point, Trudy, what you were saying before, how it's so important to see, you know, more of the next generation learning about this, getting involved. Can you both just kind of give us briefly like your background, what led you to be able to have these amazing positions and, you know, what, what were you inspired by? I know you mentioned your, um, 
your, you know, your science uh, uh, club or, or whatever it was. I had something like that too, actually, that got me very into it when oh. I was in high school. Um, but you know, what, what was it that really attracted you to this and how did you, what was your path to get to these positions? Yes. Yeah, so, so real quickly, you know, I actually was one of those kids that grew up and I knew I wanted to be an OBGYN, you know, that was what I wanted to do and be. And I, I, uh, summer before my senior year of high school, I was uh, selected to be in this NASA SHARP program. And it just, it changed my life. I saw engineers and scientists who looked like me and who um, were just rock stars in, in my world. And then it was really from there, I learned about this NASA partnership with um, an HBCU Spelman College, which is my alma mater. Um, and I, uh, a, um, applied for the Women in Science and Engineering um, scholarship that NASA had with Spelman and was selected and went to Spelman. And it was a 3-2 program. So it was uh, um, Spelman and Georgia Tech. So I did chemistry at Spelman and then the last two years did in, uh, chemical engineering at Georgia Tech. And so that kind of started me uh, on my path um, to, to end up here at NASA. Wow. And Trudy, what about you? Yeah, so let's see. Um, growing up, I was, uh, I always loved school, love, love, love school. Um, and uh, did particularly well in math, I would say, um, you know, math, especially and, and science as well. And um, had a dad who worked his whole career as a Ford Motor Company engineer. I grew up in Michigan and always, he always encouraged me with, with my grades in math and science to pursue, um, you know, an engineering type of degree and had a lot of teachers in high school. I can remember, especially my calculus teacher in high school, really encouraging me to um, look at, at engineering as well and happened to live about 30 minutes uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan and went mm -hmm. to the University of Michigan. If there are any, if there are any Buckeyes online listening and I please don't hold it against me. I know it's Michigan, Ohio State week. It's a big week. <laughs> I just hope both teams have fun. But anyway, um, so, so got an aerospace engineering degree there from, from U of M. And I think it was really the encouragement of some others who saw some of the aptitudes, um, you know, that I had that really uh, made the difference for me. And, and, and my dad would always tell me, he's like, you don't have to stick with engineering as a career, but you can build off of that. You can get an MBA, you can get a law degree, um, you can become a patent lawyer, you can, and he would kind of run through all the things that were options for me in case like, you know, someday I just didn't want to uh, go into engineering. Um, but I will tell you this, that too, with NASA in particular, um, you know how you're young and you're kind of like, well, I don't want to do the thing that's most familiar to me. I looked around and um, a lot of people I knew that were going, getting engineering degrees were going into the automotive industry. And I just wanted to see something else. Mm -hmm. And um, and in high school as well, in my junior year of high school, I was in my physics class and uh, in January 1986 and Challenger blew up. And they, this was in the days when they rolled in an audio visual cart with the TV on it. Okay. I mean, uh, kids can't even relate to this anymore. Yeah. Like my kids are walking around with their phones. Right. And <laughs> so they would just look at anyway, they rolled in the AV cart. Um, Mr. Krupka, my physics teacher stopped class and he said, we're just going to watch this. And we certainly did. And then coverage of all of that. And it really had an impact on me. And, and um, I just always associated NASA with excellence and uh, really big things bigger than, you know, than myself. And um, it was always very compelling to me for whatever reason. And so that's why I chose aerospace engineering. That's how I ultimately ended up at NASA and mm -hmm. um, I've been very fortunate in my career to have a, a lot of, um, a lot of great opportunities. So that's, that's how it happened for me. That's incredible. Yeah. Just the way that so many of these little things kind of add up over your life to, uh, to bring you to wherever it is that you are. That's so cool. Um, and, uh, Tana, you were telling us too, before as well, that you guys now are making more of an effort, uh, with this comic first woman, right. Um, to try to, and Trudy, you're nodding to you, you might be involved as well, um, <laughs> to try to really reach more of the youth, you know, through, um, yes. comics and graphic novels. Can you talk a little bit about first woman? Yes. That's just such an excellent, uh, initiative that NASA started, you know, because we, you know, our, our goal truly is to put the uh, first woman um, or first and first uh, person of color um, on um, 
uh, on the moon. And so this is just an outstanding, I mean, it's got the, um, the QR code that uh, students um, can, uh, can access through their phones and um, go to this amazing story um, of Callie Rodriguez, um, who's the first woman. And so we have just been promoting first woman like you wouldn't believe. And it has just it's been so well received. And, um, you know, so many enthusiasts uh, and young people have just absolutely loved it. And so I think the first story um, has been released. And so I think now they're waiting on the second um, the second story uh, for that. And so it's just been, it's just been an outstanding uh, initiative for, for NASA and I'm excited about it uh, as well. And Trudy, that's, available, that's available online too, right? Yes, yes, definitely available, available online. Absolutely. Oh, great. We just put a link to it in yes. the chat. So great. everyone, please check it out. It's really cool. Please check it out. It's awesome. Yeah, I've, yeah there's I've, uh, an app. Go ahead. There's an app you can download. I just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Cool. I posted that link in uh, all of the different relevant chats. So you see that nasa.gov slash special slash Kelly first. If you click on that, you can get over to uh, more information about the first woman graphic novel. Very cool. All right. Any other uh, questions from the chat? Well, I had a couple of things actually come in here while we were talking. So let me get just one second. Uh, a text message came through on my phone as soon as we mentioned pool noodles. And apparently, folks from the office over there at Lompoc, um, near Vandenberg Space Force Base, had a Halloween costume for Lofted, <laughs> which involved pool noodles, it seems. You guys are so creative. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> This was like a, a Halloween thing yep. there at, at the town near the Space Force Base. We're Lofted launched from, right? Launched from Vandy Absolutely. over there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Those are our calm, our two of our calm ladies, uh, Kat Botch wearing the actual Lofted uh, lofted suit, and, um, and that's Holly Ellis uh, in the blue NASA shirt. And I believe the lady in the middle... Um, the head of the chamber in Lompoc. Yes, the, the head of the chamber in Lompoc. So that was just a just a cool. It's right around Halloween, uh, the first launch attempt. So uh, just had lots of fun with that. <laughs> I, I love it that we you know we talked about pool noodles and there may or may not have been space <laughs> pool are. noodles, and then all of a sudden there's a costume made out of pool noodles. Oh, like I'm uh, so glad you all. I'm so glad we had that picture. I was gonna I was gonna mention that. I was like you know we actually made a lofted costume out of pool noodles and it was perfect it was perfect it is absolute perfect and thank you for making my phone buzz there i got that off the phone so we could show it here um i love it I, there's again there's a lot of really technical questions that I don't think we're going to go into but there was that I there was one that I really wanted to sort of talk about and it's it's sort of how the ideas um, that the technology director goes through sort of go from idea to being done as a project, right? And so it's specifically, how does an idea get from a spark to an actual demonstration at space? Is it like one person pushing an idea forward? Is it like an entire organization asking for that? Is it a company coming in for asking it? But, but if there are great ideas that people have, how can they be involved and how does that idea turn into more than an idea? Here's Trudy. Yeah, yeah, so I'll start. Um... So uh, multiple different ways um, for, for ideas to go along what we call the technology readiness level spectrum, which is from like one to, to nine. One is the kind of ide ideation stage. Nine is that it's been used so many times. It's, it's, it's um, we know it's gonna work every single time. Um, and so it, it depends, it depends uh, where ideas come from. It can be academia. Um, we, have, we have this pro program of stuff we called early stage innovation. Um, we give a lot of funding to um, companies, small business companies, the, where ideas come from. Um, uh, so academia, individuals with the prizes and challenges that I mentioned, um, small businesses, uh, we have a whole host of different funding sources where um, we can investigate some of these things and go from kind of ideation to lab to try to do some early testing, early early concept testing. Mm -hmm. um, and if it works well there, we'll take it to the next step. So there's a series of next steps. You take it to like a breadboard, um, which is a low fidelity type of hardware situation to a brass board, which is a little bit higher fidelity. Um, to some more 
um, uh, uh, higher, higher fidelity hardware that we produce and then we test in a lab um, on the ground. And that's kind of the technology maturation piece of it where it's coming up through um, that kind of pipeline, we call it, yep. and going through that testing. Um, is is that the technology that, readiness level? Is that the pipeline you're sort of talking about there? It's a scale. It's that's really the scale by which we measure where it's like a, it's like looking at it like this and saying we think it's approximately uh, four, you know, which is like a brass border. Yeah, know? yeah. You're Did I find it there? Okay, I was asking if I found the right uh, the right well, image there before there's I should. A number, I mean, you can Close. look it up. You can Google. You can Google it online. And yeah, there's a yeah. number of them, but it's I I can't see it from here. It's tiny, but it looks about right. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, nine would have been like shuttle. Anything we used on the shuttle over and over and over again. Okay, mm -hmm. that 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 was a TRL nine. Yep. Um, as an example. Um, so so yeah, we bring it up through that pipeline, and you know, um, I don't know. There's there's just very various sources that we have to to find the ideas to begin with, and then when it gets to a point where it's it's done well in all the ground testing then we can take it into the relevant environment testing we've been talking about um, for the for the last bit of time here. Um, and it gets more mature every single time we we do the subsequent testing to it. So that's kind of the process. Um, there's pitfalls along the way. I'm not going to make it, you know, all rosy. There's definitely pitfalls along the way. Sometimes technologies needs, adv they need advocates. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not just how is it doing in testing. Sometimes you need that person who will champion that technology and go to headquarters and say, this is why you need to care about this. I've seen this conversation happen over and over and over and over again. This is why you need to care about this. This is why you need to invest in it because, um, you don't always have, you know, that full awareness of, you know, there's so many competing priorities. I'll say that there are so many competing priorities for the very little, very little bit of funding that, and I, I shouldn't say it that way, but comparatively <laughs> speaking, as a, as one of the agencies that's on the discretionary side of federal budget spending, mm -hmm. NASA doesn't get a whole lot of those dollars, com you know, comparatively speaking. Um, so we have to really be wise with with how we spend uh, the 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 amount of money that we're appropriated, um, and we do take that very seriously. We we really do, and how we spend that money. We are not. Uh, our goal is to not invest in things that don't have multiple uses. Are not cross cutting things like that. Um, we have those conversations internally all the time about those best investments. So. Um, that's, it's hard. It's hard. There are, there are, we could fund X number of times more than we actually do, right? Tanya, I don't even know how to put a number on X, 10, 20, 30, 50, you know, times mm -hmm. more the, the, we, we could fund so much more than we actually do just because of the limitations on our appropriations. Um, uh, so that we're grateful for, but, but we have to be wise about how we spend it. Yeah. Absolutely, which is why we want to take what 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 Trudy and I often refer to as NASA takes smart risks. You know that the risks have to be smart um, in in this in this whole process. Um, yeah. Makes sense. There's a lot of great ideas and only only a certain amount of resources. I think we all wish there were more resources sort of diverted mm -hmm. in that direction. But uh, mm -hmm. you do have a process that you go through to sort of decide, hey, let's focus on this and then eh, this, you're going to table this for later, eh, that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, right. you do have to sort of select out what you what you spend your time, energy and resources. I mean, money on, really, right? Sure, sure. Well, I should I should also mention real quickly, if I could. I'm sure, sorry. of course. Um, you know, in, in space tech, you know, there really is like a, a sort of a, a spectrum of programs where, you know, the the technologies that are selected for certain programs kind of run along that TRL pipeline, that technology readiness level pipeline. And generally, we say there are exceptions, there, there are always outliers, but generally the, the missions and projects that are within TBM uh, Trudy, Trudy's program, my, my program, um, are generally in the five to seven, seven range of that TRL level. Gotcha. But we, we've got some great, um, some great examples of, you know, that progression and, and we're trying to do better really. And, and Trudy can talk about this as well. We we're trying to do better at, you know, um, progressing technologies through that pipeline so that it's a very smooth transition and that, 
you know, we've got the right type of, you know, estimate for for you know what this technology is going to cost in terms of you know its life cycle costs over its life yep. um and, and just making that making that smooth transition you know one i one of the amazing examples is the the rosa the rollout solar right. arrays which began in that you know sbir um, one of those early early stage um space tech programs and you know you know the success of it and what it's been used in so yep that's just a great example Gotcha. So, so it's not just, you know, you don't have like a wacky mad scientist with hair coming in talking about flux capacitors. Um, it's not <laughs> just a random idea. The ideas sort of reach a certain level of maturity. And then when they come across your desk with your group, it's time to test them. Like, let's actually demonstrate this technology. It's right there in the name, right? Technology demonstration right. missions. Um, we're not just whiteboarding things or brainstorming raw ideas. It is something where it is time to get the truth on whether this works the way that we think it's going to work. And that's where y'all come in, right? Exactly. Yeah, but but not only that, I'll say too, we match it up with NASA has um, a whole host of things we use as kind of guide stars on how to make these investments and by when they're needed. So it's kind of a big puzzle. It's a big dance of we want to be, uh, you know, here by 2035. Well, to do that, you back it up from there. OK, what do you need by when? By a project's preliminary design review, by its critical re design review. When do you need certain things? And so... Uh, we have roadmaps and we have um, envisioned future priorities and then we have these blueprint objectives. So we have several different sources of information for when do we need things by then and that helps us guide things too on, okay, if we if we invest in it now, it'll be ready by the time we need it. Oh, well, we need this one earlier. We better, you know, move this to the left or we need this one later. We can wait a little while to invest in those things. Right. So that's a big piece of it too, is the timing right. of it all, you know, cost, mm -hmm. cost um, equals schedule, you know, kind of uh, money, money is time. Um, and that's, that's true for us too. So it's a, it, it's a big puzzle on how we put yeah. that all together. Excellent point. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, again, I mean, I can keep going through questions all day. <laughs> Were either of you involved with the green propellant infusion mission? Was that one of the things under you? Okay, y'all are nodding. We both were. Somebody we in chat were. is very interested in the green propellant infusion mission and keeps asking we questions. And I'm it. like, I don't know if we're talking about that today. Is <laughs> they were asking we about, the, about it. the status and were you involved and is it successful and any ideas for using it? Like, talk about green, green propellant infusion mission there uh, for this one person in we, chat. I think we both we both can. I'll just I'll just preface it by saying that when I came into TDM, GPM was an established mission. Um, and um, I think it was developed over about 10 years, if I'm, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, but it, it actually um, was a major, major launch uh, for TDM, one of the technologies that we launched. It actually launched along with uh, DSAC2, Deep Space Atomic Clock. Um, I'm sorry, did I say DSAC2? I meant DSAC, okay. Deep Space Atomic Clock. Um, those are two missions that launched on the... Um, uh, Air Force, U.S. Air Force um, SPT-2 mission um, out of out of um, uh, Cape Canaveral, and uh, I believe it launched about um, June of 2019 uh, is when it launched. And um, so, yeah, GPM was GPM um, was was our partnership with Ball Aerospace, um, and it had about I want to say about a 13 month run. Uh, but but Trudy, I think you were um, you were the program executive for for TBM when it came to the program, correct? I was, I was, I was also the person. I was um, before that. I was at Glenn Research Center and um, uh, got the the call from Ball Aerospace that they wanted to partner with us on this. Uh, Glenn Research Center is known for being a power and propulsion um, expertise, um, and. Um, the idea there was to use an Air Force developed monopropellant, um, not hydrazine. Um, you know, hydrazine is um, highly toxic for uh, ground workers yep. and um, the Air Force developed, um, it was called AFM 315E, but now it's called Ascent um, mm -hmm. because I think AFM 315E was not something people easily remember. Hard to say. Um, it just, it always just stuck in my head because I'd seen it so many times. Oh, um, on right. charts and things. Right. Yeah. And so that's the monopropellant, non-toxic monopropellant that they designed this around. 
And um, the thruster itself um, was supposed to be a 10 Newton thruster. There were problems with that thruster. They scaled it back to a one Newton thruster. That was a ball partnership with Aerojet Rocketdyne. So Aerojet supplied mm -hmm. the thruster, ball supplied, supplied the, um, the BCP-100 spacecraft. And, um, uh, and so that is, is what we went with. The demonstration itself was, was highly successful. Um, but I, I would say the usage of that technology to date has, has been maybe a little bit disappointing. Um, you know, thought that it would really be infused into some product lines and things like that and still waiting on that to happen. Right. So, uh, yeah, successful demonstration, um, but usage of it, not as much. I think the, the fuel itself is doing quite well. Um, but I think, um, you know, that the, the product line that uses that fuel is still has to materialize. So gotcha. Yeah. So, so people are still filling their spacecraft with spicy orange gas, I think is how we <laughs> usually right. uh, refer that's to right. it. <laughs> Do yeah. not... and, if you, and if you were to actually look at the green propellant, that's just one of the cool things. It was actually like more salmon in right? color. <laughs> it, wasn't actually, it wasn't actually green. It wasn't um, actually green. Salmon. <laughs> it's actually green, more salmon in color. But you know, you know, it, it, but Trudy's, Trudy's right. Right. You know, it's been a little bit, um, um, you know, it hasn't taken off like we would have expected, you know, it to be a, what we thought, you know, as a really cross cutting um, type of technology. Um, but, you know, one of the one of the great things about it, you know, in terms of access to space, you know, people could actually fill spacecraft in their shirt sleeves. I mean, that's right. unheard of versus, you know, using using hydrazine. And so, um, yep. you know, have some really great. And so we're not certainly not not giving up on that but we think it has it has some potential I'd, I'd bring up a picture of people working on a spacecraft that filled with hydrazine but I, I don't want anybody to come after me for showing the wrong spacecraft um, <laughs> if you've ever seen like when certain little spacecraft that like to stay in space for a long time and nobody knows about them uh, come back down and land on the runway and you see the people in the full body protective gear mm -hmm. Right, that is a spacecraft that uses some of the non-green, let's say, propellants, the uh, hydrazine, like you're talking about there, and it requires a lot of personal protective gear. Um, you do not want to breathe the, the the gas that that stuff is. So, the green propellant is a totally different thing, but not quite being adopted yet. It sounds like, right? <laughs> Okay, we have been going for more than an hour and a half. I think we might have kept y'all a little bit over here because we just started talking about random missions and then another one came up. Uh, but I do believe we are coming to the end of our show here today. Um, Trudy and Tanya, thank you so much for spending time on the weekend here and just having a fantastic conversation about your experiences uh, working with all these technology demonstrations. Yeah, the stuff you guys do is so incredibly cool. And I'm sure everyone out there watching is just blown away and can't wait to hear more and see more about all of these cool things that you're doing. Thank you for having us. I know I, I, I Trudy can speak for herself as, as you've heard, uh, but we are so excited. We were so excited to be part of this conversation today. Thank you for making it so fun. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. And um I'm really impressed with your audience. I'm impressed with both of you. I don't know if you're off there studying or reading space news or whatever on your free time, but I don't even know how people in your audience know about green propellant fusion mission. This thing we did a couple of years. That's impressive. One person that. did. One person but, asked like four yeah. times about the, the GPO. Outstanding. Outstanding. The, the people can cite technology demonstration missions as even part of our program and know what that is. That's that's darn impressive to me. So You're thank making you for a difference. The, you, you are, are. definitely thank making you. an impact well, out there. I would just say thank you for the interest in this. You know, it, it's not the premier stuff that NASA does with big Artemis missions. I really mean that. Like we often feel mm -hmm. like we are behind the scenes doing things you will hear about in 10, 15, 20, 30, right. 40 years that are, we're enabling. Um, by that time, I'll be long gone. I mean, and I mean, oh, the dog just busted in. My dog. Anyway, my dog. It's okay. Here now. It's okay. The dog is coming to end the show. Like. <laughs> exactly right. The dog might have got a computer okay, cable too. Um, and so thank you. <laughs> too funny. Yes. Um, I think we might have uh, had a pet related incident. There we go. Okay. Trudy's back. All right. There she the dog's going to get into the show in the background as well. <laughs> Trudy, it's absolutely fine. Uh, not a big deal at all. Um, again, Trudy, 
<laughs> Trudy and Tanya, thank you so much. Y'all are part of NASA's technology technology demonstration missions and the Space Technology Mission Directorate. I really do appreciate y'all spending time hanging out with us. I'm glad you had some fun. I know sometimes we tell some jokes and we talk about pool noodles and stuff, but uh, <laughs> also a lot of very technically minded folks watching. And it's always a blast having interesting people who do awesome things in space on to chat with us. We really appreciate y'all taking time out of the weekend. Um, next, to be here. next Thanks up, y'all, coming up is going to be next month's virtual astronomy live. I got my housekeeping stuff here, and I have to click through. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, uh, we're actually changing the name of the show next month. It's going to be Intrepid Museum's Astro Live. That's right. We realized, yeah, we talk about astronomy sometimes, but we talk about a lot of other cool stuff like Lofted and Psyche and, you know, all of the other cool things that we do quite a bit more. So uh, we are actually going to be changing the name ever so slightly. Intrepid Museum's Astro Live is how you will now be seeing it in the future starting next month. Uh, same great show, just a little tweak of the name. And yes, our next show will be Sunday, December 18th, three o'clock. Uh, and the topic we are still confirming our uh, our huh. final guest details, but I will give you a teaser. It will probably be about a historic mission to the moon. It's vague enough, <laughs> but very specific at the same time. So, 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 so start thinking about as well. <laughs> yeah, it's historic missions to the moon, and what could that mean? Our options have recently expanded in what that may mean. Um, also, folks, remember that the Virtual Astronomy Lives don't just magically happen. They're supported through the NASA Cooperative Agreement, awarded to the New York Space Grants Consortium. Massive thanks for helping us make these happen. As Also, we keep doing these shows because y'all keep showing up. The viewers who are watching at home, asking fantastic questions, all the different channels on Facebook and YouTube and all the different places uh, that you can experience this. So once again, Trudy and Tanya, we really do appreciate y'all. We had a great time. But for now, that's going to be the end of this week's month's Virtual Astronomy Live. And we will see you nerds later. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys. <laughs>